Okay, so here we go. Last time we were uh, talking about partial derivatives. And remember we made uh, uh, this, I'm going to say definition. Uh, this is really just a, here's how you compute it. If you want to get all rigorous about it, the definition's slightly different. doesn't matter for our purposes. Uh, the big idea is you identify one of the variables that you're going to treat as actually being a variable. And then you're going to just pretend that all the other variables are constants. Now what had been a multivariable function, uh, at least for the purposes of this little imaginary game we're playing where all the other variables are constant, for those purposes, this is now a single variable function. And once you have a single variable function, then you can just talk about just the regular plain old Math 111L derivative of that function. Right. So that's all a partial derivative is, uh, computationally anyway. We talked about notation. Do keep in mind that this symbol that we use to represent partial derivatives, very importantly, this is not a D, and it is not the lowercase Greek letter delta. Little things like this really do matter. So, uh, again, um, make sure to be careful about that. Um, okay, so uh, we talked about this as our first example. Uh, it is, uh, I would say, an unexpectedly convenient example because at first glance you look at this and you see, oh my gosh, there's three factors in there. I'm going to have to use the product rule multiple times. And then, oh, oh my gosh, there's a composition and a product inside of the composition. Good night, right? This looks hard, tedious. Uh, but the big point to realize is that we are taking the partial with respect to y. That means y is our only variable. That means x is a constant, and therefore e to the x is a constant, and therefore oh, also z is a constant, and therefore all that's constant, therefore all of this is constant. In fact, the bulk of what we are looking at in this expression is constant. And really, there's just this single function of y that's actually uh, not constant, right? So for derivative purposes, for partial derivative purposes, partial with respect to y, that is, this is a constant times y squared, right? So uh, super convenient. I treat constants like I treat any other constants. And uh, when you take a partial of a constant excuse me, partial of a uh, y squared with respect to y, you get 2y. Uh, let's see here. So that turns into 2y. And the constant comes along for the ride as constants do. Everybody happy with that? Yeah. So like, I, don't, I still don't fully understand the difference between like a partial derivative and like a regular derivative. So they apply to completely different functions. That's the, I'm just I'm interrupting because there's a very crisp answer there, right? The, the regular derivative that you saw in Calc 1 classes applies only strictly, very strictly, just to single variable functions, mm -hmm. right? So partial derivatives apply, again, <laughs> only to multivariable functions, right? So now, uh, how are they different? I mean, other things that you know about single variable derivatives? Yeah, well, we haven't even gotten to the analogous, you know, like questions for multivariable and partial derivatives. But that's the big distinction, is that they apply to entirely disjoint sets of functions. Right. Is that, is that satisfying? It is. Okay, cool. All right, so let's see another couple of quick examples, and I'm going to be quick with this because these are uh, also pretty straightforward and mostly in here for dramatic purposes. Uh, let's look at this partial derivative right here. And again, it looks scary. It looks like a function to the power of a function. But it's not. This is a partial with respect to x. x is our variable. That means this is a function, but it's being raised to the power of, well, what is, in fact, just a great big constant. So this is not function to the power of a function. This is function to the power of a constant. The power rule applies just fine, right? And as you see, it works out. It feels weird to do this uh, because it feels like, you know, can I really just take that exponent constant and just subtract one? But it looks like a function. Shouldn't I have to do like logarithmic differentiation or something? Nope, just a constant for the purposes of a partial derivative with respect to x. Now, if we were taking a partial with respect to y, it would be a totally different story. The x partial goes down real easy. 
Okay, uh, likewise, this next example, uh, again, looks like a function of the power of a function. Nope. Z is our only variable. Everything else is a constant, constant, constant. Therefore, this whole base is just a, uh, a ugly looking constant. And we have an old rule from way back when as to how to take the uh, derivative. This is ultimately, this is an exponential. Constant to the power of the variable. Right? And we have an old rule from, from uh, Calc 1 as to how to take derivatives of exponentials. Okay. All righty. So now let's, let's uh, rewind a little bit. Uh, let's take stock of what we have. I've written down a, I'm going to loosely speaking say a definition in the sense that, okay, here's how you compute this thing I'm calling a partial derivative. We have a definition. We have notation. We've seen that computationally it's actually kind of easy. Not that much to it computationally. The looming question before us is, is this good for anything, or are we just making pointless exercises for no apparent reason? Right? What, how does this connect to reality in any useful way? What is this good for? Right? And so that's uh, actually a significant question. It's going to take us a little bit of time. Um, the uh, first headline that I want to <laughs> emphasize on this is right here. Uh, if you want to know what this looks like, it looks like several different things. It depends on what kind of a picture you're looking at, right? Remember, we just got through making a huge deal out about the difference between the graph of a function and a level set of a function. Uh, or said differently, if you're looking at a particular geometric object, well, it's the graph of one function, but it's a level set of a totally different function. Which function should you look at? Right to make whatever geometric interpretation you're interested in. So we're going to have uh, multiple little um, uh, explorations to kind of try to straighten out before we can really understand what partial derivatives look like. All right, so moving along. Uh, let's start with uh, the graph picture. Now, I emphasize, because this is the graph picture, the conclusions we're about to come to, they only apply if indeed your picture is a graph of the function whose partial derivative you're talking about. Right, so that's that's really, really important. All right, now that said, uh, notice we are looking indeed here at a graph. We're looking at z equals this function of x and y. Uh, notice our function of x and y uh, is uh, from r2 to r1. So two input variables, one output variable. Uh, remember, the usual deal with making graphs is those two input variables. Um, in a case like this, anyway, you can kind of think of the xy plane down here as sort of representing kind of sort of the domain in a sense, right? I mean, uh, you know, close enough. And then, of course, the output value, the target, the output value we call z, and we have a z-axis here as well. Okay, so this is our this is the role that the variables are playing and how they show up on the picture. And with all of that said, let's ask the question now. Um, how would I compute a partial with respect to y? Uh, notice uh, at a certain point, right? So we're going to be looking at this point a comma b in the domain. Uh, again, I'm sloppily but forgivably representing a comma b as being in the xy plane of this three-dimensional picture, right? And at that point, partial with respect to y, what does it look like? Okay. So, the good news. This thing we're trying to understand, two-step process, both of those individual steps, we already have existing geometric interpretations. Basically, all I have to do is kind of draw the picture accordingly, step by step. So, uh, step one, you'll recall, taking a partial derivative is to fix all of the other variables. Now, we're taking a partial with respect to y. That means that the other variables, well, it's just x. So, we're going to fix x. And, of course, if I fix it, and if it's a, <laughs> then I'm fixing it at the value a, right? So fixing the other variable, treating the other variable as a constant in this case just means look at the plane x equals a, 
And here it is. There's A. Here's the plane x equals A perpendicular to the x-axis. And we, I can tell you exactly what that looks like. That's a vertical plane. right? And we are interested then not in the entire graph anymore. We're only interested in this vertical cross-section. Uh, I'm going to say perpendicular to the x-axis. The vertical cross-section in this plane x equals A, which is perpendicular to the x-axis, but you're going to notice also it is parallel to the y-axis. This is another little easy little source of confusion to accidentally oops. Uh, and uh, you've got to keep in mind which variable is constant, which variable is not constant, and therefore this plane is parallel to which one and per perpendicular to which one. It's easy to get those switched. So make sure to think it through. Make sure to be careful about that. How are we doing? Everybody good? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, again, reminder, we started off with a graph, which in this case was a surface, but we're taking this cross section in this, uh, in this X equals A plane, and so we're now no longer interested in the whole thing. We're now interested only in this cross section curve. And now let's talk about what I can say about this cross section curve. What's that a picture of? Well, uh, it, this curve, is, the heights are still values of z, right? Values of the function uh, as computed for uh, different values of y. So I'm going to make the observation, since height is the value of the function for a given value of y, I, that means that this curve is the graph of z thought of only as a function of y. In other words, this cross-section curve is the graph of our new single variable function that we're about to take a derivative of. Right? And what happens when you take a derivative of a single variable function? Well, when you take a derivative of a single variable function on the graph, the derivative gives you the slope of the tangent line to that graph. Okay, so putting all this together, uh, let's see here. I guess I can do it like this. Putting all of this together. Where's my eraser? Here we go. Okay, what is the partial derivative with respect to y? Well, the partial with respect to y says you're going to uh, look at the uh, function in the y direction. Oh, wrong. I wanted the highlighter. Uh, you're going to look at the function in the y direction because you're taking a cross section in that plane. Right? Um, you're going to look at the graph, uh, the cross section of the graph, just in that direction. Uh, then you're going to look at the tangent line and ask for what is the slope. That's what a partial derivative is. It's the slope of the tangent line. Um, <clears throat> to oversimplify things, so this is great news. This is very familiar. This is very satisfying. Derivative. Slope of the tangent line, just like it was in Calc 1, uh, feels very uh, very comforting for it to work out in that familiar way. Uh, just do keep in mind it's not quite that simple, right? Um, it's not just the so slope of the tangent line. This is actually a surface, right? So it, there's a lot of tangent lines pointing in various different directions. The partial derivative is the slope very specifically of the tangent line that's pointing in the direction of the variable you're taking the partial with respect to. Okay. All right. Now, what we've got here is an argument uh, with corresponding pictures, step by step, thought through and interpreted, and then summarized. And now what I'm going to leave as an exercise for y'all is to think through what happens if you're taking the partial with respect to x. Again, you don't have to, but I think this is a really valuable exercise. Um, Draw the corresponding pictures. Think about what's a constant, what's a variable. What does that mean geometrically? Cross section in which direction? Perpendicular to what? Et cetera, et cetera. Right? And what you're going to find is the x partial 
is the slope of the tangent line to the graph in the x direction exactly as you would expect. Good exercise to think it through, draw the pictures, etc. Okay, how are we doing? Is everybody on board? Yeah. Okay, okay now, <clears throat> reminder. Uh, you're going to get a different geometric interpretation for every kind of picture. We have been looking so far just at the graph. So the geometric interpretation we have so far is just for graphs. What if we're not looking at a graph? Uh, more to the point, what if we're looking at a, let's say, a level set of the function whose partial we're interested in? Or we're looking at the what I like to call the literal picture of the function whose partial we're interested in. Uh, now, what does it look like? And it is absolutely not a slope of a tangent line. Uh, so here we go. Let's uh, let's do the literal picture first. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any surface to even talk about tangent lines to. So again, forget about that whole business about slopes. Partial derivatives don't have squat to do with slopes in this picture. So I'm going to remind you, partial derivatives do have uh, multiple interpretations. And one of our interpretations of a partial derivative is that it's um, uh, what you multiply by the input change to get the output change. Y'all remember that old interpretation? Uh, keeping in mind that y is our variable, that means that x and z are to be held constant. That means that x and z never move off of, uh, oh gosh, ah, no never move off of uh, this point where uh, z is fixed and x is fixed. So that means because we're talking about this y partial and x and z are fixed, that we're moving only in this direction because that's the only direction that remains. That's the only direction that's possible because x and z are constant, which means that we are moving in the y direction. And <clears throat> how much we move in the y direction, we have a pretty standard uh, uh, notation, terminology for what it means to change something by a little bit. Here we're changing the input by a little bit. We use the idea of a differential, just like in Calc 1. Right? So dy is our differential. And again, you multiply the input differential times the derivative and that gives you the output differential, namely our, our estimate, our linear estimate of how much the function changes. So um, uh, this is kind of the picture. Uh, it's not as satisfying as the graph picture. But uh, again, uh, apples and oranges, right? It's not fair to compare this picture for a very difficult function that has three inputs and one output, but we don't even have a graph picture here, right? So in an apples and apples comparison, this is still way better than the graph picture, namely nothing, right? So it's something. So, so the interpretation we're going to take here of a partial derivative is it's the factor that you multiply by input change to get output change. It's the factor you multiply by input change with the understanding that y is the only change that's happening. There's no movement in the z direction. There's no movement in the x direction. Right? With the understanding of that the other variables are all constant, input change to output change, partial derivative is just the factor. Okay. That's the best I can give you in this context. And again, this is an important context. <clears throat> Let's talk about level sets. Now again, Totally different picture. This is not the literal picture. It's definitely not the graph picture for the function we're interested in. Now, here's the easy landmine to step on that a lot of students uh, mess up. A, a lot of students look at uh, the various level sets and they say, okay, well, that there, for example, that particular level set is a curve, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, if you want to take a derivative and there's a curve, there's this compelling urge to say that it's the slope of that curve. And it's absolutely not. Definitely, definitely, definitely not. Because this is not a graph. 
of the function that we're interested in. This is a level set of the function we're interested in. Does everybody see why that's absolutely nonsense? This is the slope of that purple line is not the partial derivative. It's not either of the partial derivatives. Okay. All right. So uh, how do we make sense out of uh, the idea of a level set in this circumstance? Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of these lines here just for, oh gosh. There's one of them, and here's another one of them. Ah, it's harder than it looks. Okay, so there's two of our level sets. Um, again, you know, when we're looking at level sets, you can think about each one representing a constant value of temperature, constant value of altitude. I like the altitude one in this circumstance because it's more visceral. Okay. Um, so how would I interpret partial derivatives in this case? And uh, let's think about that one direction at a time. If I look at a partial with respect to x, well, as I move in the x direction, that is how far I have to move in the x direction to get from the first level set to the second level set. In other words, to, uh, <clears throat> to climb the 200 feet that it would take me to get from that starting point to, you know, sort of two contour lines over, that 200 feet I have to do over a very small distance. And if I have to climb 200 feet over a very short distance, that means it's really steep. Um, and that means that the uh, x partial is large. <coughs> now there's, again, kind of a backwardsness, um, you know, small and therefore large awkwardness here. Um, it's a small distance between the contour lines, and that means it's a large value of the, uh, of, of the partial. Said differently, that thing that's small in the picture is a denominator, if you will. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, all right, so now let's think about what happens if you move in the y direction. Same two contour lines, and moving in the y direction, you can see uh, it takes me a much greater distance to get between those same two contour lines. Well, that's more my kind of hike at this point, right? That's, um, I don't want to have to get my 200 feet of elevation gain over a short distance. I want to drag that out over a longer distance so it won't be as steep. Uh, and so the in this picture, the y partial is small, relatively small. Everybody happy with that? Now you notice one thing about this is it's hard for me to quantify based on what's drawn because I, you know, I, th there's an arbitrariness in, okay, well, what is the altitude difference between these contour lines? There's no magic law that says it has to be 100 feet. I've seen a lot of contour maps where they use 40 feet. I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? It's so weird. Um, so anyway, uh, the, since we don't know what the actual scale in some sense is, I can't tell you exactly what in the picture is precisely the interpretation of the partial derivative. What I can tell you is that roughly speaking, it's inversely related to how close the lines are in that direction, right? as, uh, as we've seen with these two little cases here. Everybody happy? Not a slope. Okay. Alrighty, moving along. So, um, yeah, so y'all remember linear approximations, I hope. Uh, this was uh, a big deal in Calc 1, and uh, this function right here, you know, for a single variable function, right? This function right here we call the linear approximation, and there's various different justifications for why we call it a linear approximation, but uh, sort of... Um, you know, the, the, the initial satisfaction is that this is a function whose graph is a tangent line to the graph of the original function. So that's a, sort of a geometric take. Uh, another way to think about this function, this function, among all possible, uh, you know, functions whose graphs are lines, technically not linear, is it, right? Because it doesn't necessarily go through the origin. This constant term kind of messes that all up. But anyway, but we sweep that under the rug. Among functions that look kind of like this, this is the one that best approximates the function. 
in uh, in uh, standard you know uh, normal scenarios. Okay. Um, so uh, now, how are we going to define it? And again, there's a million choices there. I'm going to go with what I think is most useful and convenient here. This is the function. Um, the degree one polynomial that has the same value as the function it's approximating and the same derivative as the function that it's approximating. And there will always be, uh, well, if uh, there's a little disclaimer up here, I'll come back to it in a moment, uh, it's assuming that linear approximations exist, there's always exactly one function of this form that that, that, that agrees with f in terms of value and derivative at the point in question. I think that's a nice point of view. Everybody good? Ringing bells? Familiar? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is what we're going to mimic when we try to come up with the idea of a linear approximation of a multivariable function. And so, in fact, let me... Uh, it like this. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Um, multivariable function. Right? Multiple input variables. Um, what we're going to do is look for a function uh, that uh, best approximates that function. I claim this is what does it. And it's going to be the function that agrees with f in value and in uh, derivative. Wait a minute. So der uh, wait, there's a bunch of different partial derivatives. I need this function to agree with f not only in the partial derivative with respect to x1, but also the partial with respect to x2 and 3 and 4 and all the way through and including agreeing with f in its partial with respect to xn. Right, so this is uh, sort of the copycat idea. Uh, let's find a function that's you know linear-ish in this sense uh, that uh, mimics <coughs> f in value and derivatives. Total ripoff of what we did in a Calc one context. And uh, I'm going to leave it as an exercise for y'all to confirm uh, that this function l, defined as such, has these two properties. This function l that I have in purple does indeed agree with f in value at the point a and it does indeed agree with f in its partial derivatives all of its partial derivatives at the point a so all you got to do is compute right plug in it works uh, one little tricky uh, bit I'm going to point out a lot of students get uh, messed up on this a lot of students will look at this expression let's uh, do this one a lot of students will look at that expression and say, oh, okay, well, f's a function, so its partial derivative is a function. And they worry that this is a function that uh, when they are taking the various <coughs> other partials down here, that won't, wait, doesn't, doesn't that give me like a second derivative or something? And no, it doesn't. So very importantly, what I have in blue here, uh, partial is a function, but... This says evaluated at the point A. And when you take a function, however weird it looking it may be, a function, when you plug in a fixed constant value, uh, that whole thing then becomes a constant. And so, in fact, all of this here, this is just a great big constant. So keep that in mind, right, uh, as you're uh, going through and doing this algebra to confirm this uh, this thing here. Is that cool? By the way, think about the analog up here. The analog would be to say, hey, f prime is a function. Don't I have to, uh, wouldn't I be taking a derivative of the f prime at some point and checking condition two? Nope, because you're plugging in the value a. That means f prime uh because it's evaluated at the fixed point A, this is, in fact, just a great big constant. So totally likewise down here. All right, so give those a try. As always, come to office hours. If you have any questions, happy to help. Uh, now, this, uh, this function here, this is called our linear approximation for a multivariable 
function uh, to, be, to emphasize. Multivariable, but notice still real valued. Only one output value. Only one coordinate comes out. <coughs> All right, and you look at this function, and uh, you're going to notice pretty quickly that uh, it's kind of lengthy and inconvenient to write it all down. It's clunky. Right? So the clever observation here is to just notice that uh, if you look at this right here, you have a sum of products, and in particular, um, there are these factors here, and then there are these factors here, and we have, therefore, a sum of products of uh, lists of numbers. Where have we heard that before? A sum of products of lists of numbers. It sounds an awful lot like dot product, doesn't it? Right? And this is a very convenient little observation to make. If you just take all of these, what I have circled in green, and if you say, I'm going to call those the coordinates of this thing, this, uh, I'm going to, we'll talk about terminology in a second, uh, but uh, this thing here, and then if I notice, hey, all of these blue factors, these are all exactly the coordinates of the x vector minus the a vector. This is literally what I have in blue, literally the vector x minus a. And so this whole great big thing up here, this isn't the whole linear approximation, of course, but that's, uh, that's all, it's a lot of, it's most of the linear approximation, there's one extra constant term, right? But that whole great big thing can be rewritten as a dot product much more compact, much more sort of uh, convenient to, to write. And so uh, very standard. So now notice in order to make this work, I did have to kind of make some stuff up. I had to, I had to decide seemingly arbitrary, motivated just by uh, the desire to clean up this mess, right? To make up a new vector whose coordinates are these partial derivatives. So this thing needs a name at this point. And uh, we use the word gradient. And there's uh, various interpretations of gradients that we'll talk about mostly later on. Uh, for the moment, that's just a name. It's called the gradient. We're going to use this notation, very standard. Um, uh, this uh, is an upside down triangle. By the way, very important that the triangle have its point downward, not upward. When it's upward, like a right side up triangle, it actually means something else that's importantly different from this, right? So uh, again, uh, the, the you know subtleties of notation really do matter. So please do be careful about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My question: If we yep. are using a function that doesn't end up as a scalar and it's like like a like a vector valued function, yeah, yeah then the, then the, what we've got here doesn't work. Okay. So yeah, so now you you ask a very natural. Question and we're gonna that's gonna be on the very next page. Yeah, for the moment I want to keep it uh, keep it real as it were. Yeah. Sorry, bad pun. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody happy? Okay, so yeah, we just call that the gradient. Uh, so now all of a sudden our formula for our linear approximation not quite so clunky and messy. Uh, now instead of having to deal with this whole thing there, uh, we instead have this much more compact expression here. And let me also point out, uh, if I compare, forgetting about this, if I compare this formula with my single variable formula, notice these formulas look an awful lot alike. <coughs> Value the function at the starting point. Okay, my starting point's a vector now. And then uh, up here, we had derivative times x minus a. Here, I have gradient dot x minus a. Now, the x minus a is a vector instead of a scalar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a dot product instead of a regular plain old scalar product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But structurally, you got to give me, that's pretty analogous, right? And with that idea in mind, notice that this thing that we just made up Calling it the calling it the gradient, 
that is playing exactly the role that the derivative is playing in our single variable case. So there is a pretty persuasive argument that the gradient in this role plays uh, the, the role of the derivative. It's kind of like it's it, like it's the multivariable derivative or something. And there's a strong case to be made for that. How are we doing? Are we all right? A lot of people, depending on the context and the circumstance, if you have a uh, real valued multivariable function, if they say the derivative, they don't mean one of the partials. If they say the derivative, they're probably talking about the gradient vector. So you remember a long time ago, well, last time I was talking about how there's multiple different kinds of derivatives. We've seen partial derivatives, now we have the gradient vector. And there's more to come. Okay, okay a uh, quick example, um, just to get our hands dirty. <clears throat> so uh, here we have a real valued multivariable function. And I want to consider this point 1 comma 2. And at that point 1 comma 2, I ask, what is the linear approximation of this function at that point? And we're just going to plug into this formula right here. Uh, in fact, you'll notice down at the end, let me go ahead and uh, just for sort of visual convenience. Right, uh, step one, I'm going to have to take the point and I'm going to have to plug it into the function per this formula right here, right? So the point has to get plugged into the function. And uh, the value of the function at that point is a little bit of arithmetic. Turns out to be 5, nothing to it. Okay. Everybody follow? Okay. Um, <clears throat> cool. Uh, what about this gradient thing? All right. Well, let's see. The gradient, keep in mind, the gradient is made up of the partial derivatives. Uh, so x partial, y partial, and that's just a little bit of uh, a little bit of calculus. But don't forget, as you're taking partial derivatives, you got to remember which variable is is a variable for the purposes of your partial, and which variables are to be treated as constants for the purposes of that partial. So uh, two different partials, variables playing different roles in these two different calculations. Easy to accidentally get confused and mess that up. So please do be careful about. Um, again, we need to plug in this point A, right? So plugging in that point into our gradient formulas that we just computed, and we get that this evaluated gradient right here is just 2 comma 4, like so. Yeah? All right, and it's kind of all over with the shouting. Uh, but, uh, of course, we, ah, I didn't want to do that. Okay, uh, we do uh, have to um, dot this now with x minus a. And, of course, uh, the a vector we've already got. There's the a vector. And you can see the 1 and the 2 right there. And we've got our x vector, which, of course, is just x comma y. And so uh, there you go. And here's our linear approximation function right here done. Everybody happy? Straight out of that formula. Now, <clears throat> I suppose you, uh, if you just want to, you could crank out this dot product and collect terms and stuff like that and write it in the sort of computationally more convenient form down here at the bottom. Uh, if you were going to if you needed this for a practical purpose and you're going to code the formula into a computer, yeah, don't have the computer sit there and produce vectors and dot products all the time. Let the computer do the less work, right? So make your program fast. Fine, sure, I suppose. Um, but in a math context where we're interested in the mathematical idea, computation is somebody else's problem, right? In a math context, I don't really see the point of uh, multiplying this out and collecting terms. This shows both an understanding of the underlying structure 
of the linear approximation, and it also shows that you know how to compute individual components. Getting from here to here is uh, trivial high school algebra. I don't see the point. I'd rather leave it like this, and I encourage you to do the same. Unless you have a reason to to actually take that last step. Yes? So, <clears throat> what is the whole thing the gradient, or is it just the 2, 4 no. after the gradient? 2, 4 is the gradient. So, the, uh, the whole thing is the linear approximation, okay. right? And uh, 2, 4 is the evaluated gradient. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, somebody asked moments ago about... What happens if it's vector valued? Um, this is a more complicated story, but honestly, it's mostly just kind of inconvenience. <laughs> it's uh, basically the same ideas. And a uh, reminder what I did in this um, real valued multivariable example is I wrote down a formula first, and then I uh, shorthanded it, came up with a convenient shorthand to uh, streamline the formula afterwards. Uh, I'm going to do it in the opposite order here because without the streamlining, it's going to be just too much to write down. It's just clunky. It's pure clunky. It's not deep. It's not sophisticated. It's just, uh, it's just too much to write down. So here's the notational convenience. It's going to be very handy to write down this matrix where you'll notice that each one of the n input variables corresponds to one of the columns, right? So in the first column, I'm taking the partials, all of those partials with respect to the first input variable, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the last column, all the partials are with respect to the last input variable. So uh, these columns, just the way this matrix is structured, um, I'm going to call these the x1 column through the xn column. Right? I think it's uh, natural terminology given that each one corresponds in this way. Okay. Now notice as well that each row corresponds to an output variable. Right. So all of these partials that we have in the top row, those are all partials of F1. So I'm going to call that top row the F1 row. Now, the, in that F1 row, there are partials with respect to various different inputs. Namely, in that top row, there are elements in various different columns. Okay. So it's a nice uh, way to keep track of the structure. By the way, it's really important not to accidentally transpose this matrix. It's very important that the columns be columns and the rows be rows. If you accidentally transpose it, you're going to get garbage answers. And so uh, uh, easy mistake to make, but important to get it right. Okay. For myself, everybody's different, but for my own sort of personal uh uh, convenience. I I think naturally in terms of what the input variables are, and uh, the inputs correspond to columns. Okay. All right. And with that noted, uh, here is our formula for the linear approximation. There we go. Uh, <coughs> there it is. And look at that, how familiar that structure is. Again, it looks just like the single variable form. It's a little different, of course, adapted appropriately. But it's still initial value and then something times input change, right? x minus a. Now, the differences are that now this thing, it's no longer a single variable derivative. It's also no longer a vector. Now that thing is an entire matrix of partial derivatives, right? Um, likewise, this operation here, that's no longer, uh, you know, high school multiplication. It's also no longer a dot product. Now this is a matrix vector product. So, you know, adapted appropriately, et cetera, et cetera. But still, basically, structurally, it's a lot like the previous formulas we've written down. Uh, notice as well, and again, this is an exercise I'm going to leave for you all to crank out on your own. Uh, this function 
agrees with F in value at the, uh, at the point A. It also agrees with F in terms of its partials. And very importantly, partials with respect to all of the different possible input variables and partials of all of the different possible output variables. So there's a whole bunch of partial derivatives to check here. So now when you, when you confirm that this formula does satisfy these rules, um, I would suggest that you just, uh, just keep your life simple. Do it for like a function that has three inputs and two outputs, something like that. You don't have to keep it general. You'll, you'll, you'll get the idea as to why this works just by doing a, you know, three variables in, two variables out kind of example. But again, I think it's a healthy exercise and please do do that. All right, so uh, example here. Oh, yeah, okay, here we go. Example. Um, again, notice I'm just going to plug into the formula. I'm just going to straight up do the formula. Uh, there it is. Uh, I'm going to need to compute this. Uh, well, let's see. First, I need to compute the value of the function. Okay, fine. The value of the function. Uh, I've got to take this function and plug in this point. Right, take this point, plug it into there, and the value of the function is, this is just a, a, a arithmetic, and the value of the function is 5 to 24, uh, I believe. Is that cool? Okay, uh, then let's see here. Now, next, uh, we need to talk about the DF matrix. So the DF matrix is uh, all of the different partials. Now again, you've got to keep the structure in mind. Now notice in this case, we have two inputs and three outputs. Um, more to the point, because there are two inputs, we're going to have two columns. The X partials all go into the first column, right? And the Y partials all go into the second column. And for each of those partials, well, we're going to be taking the partial of three output coordinates, right? And so we get three entries in each of these columns. And that's a three by two matrix. Everybody on board? All right, check the, make sure you can do the partial derivatives, right? I'm glossing over the algebra to make sure that, you know, I, I make, so make sure you can do that, but that's not good investment of time to go through those trivialities. So uh, there's the uh, the DF matrix. Again, don't forget we need to plug in this point A. So this point A has to get plugged into there. Um, the resulting actual value of the derivative matrix, the actual thing that we need with the point A plugged in uh, is a little bit more arithmetic and uh, it turns out to be this uh, result right here. And again, uh, <clears throat> you just want to make sure you can do the mechanics. So plug in, make sure you get the right numbers. By the way, I'm open to the possibility I might have, ah, you know, arithmetic is not my forte, right? Uh, I am not above uh, the occasional mistake. So if you get something different from mine, be open to the possibility that I might be wrong, right? That's, that's cool. Everybody happy? Okay, so moving along, a um, couple of quick last observations uh, before we'll talk about, uh, to, well, we'll probably call it a day after this, but uh, we've already made the observation that all the partials in the first column are all partials with respect to X1. Um, I'm going to make the observation then that that means that this is, the, the column itself is the partial of the vector valued function itself with respect to x1 because it has in it the partials of all the coordinates of f with respect to x1. So that's a neat observation that's uh, useful sometimes. Uh, each of the columns represents a partial derivative of the vector valued function. So, neat. Um, the other observation to make is that each row in each row, we're taking the partials of a single output coordinate, 
right? That's why we call this the F1 row because we're always every entry in there is a partial of F1. It's a partial of F1 though with respect to all of the different input variables and that is the very definition of a gradient. So uh, the uh, each row of this DF matrix is a gradient of the corresponding coordinate function. That's also a really useful observation. That's going to come up uh, here and there and be, uh, be useful. So heads up on that as well. Um, last observation, and then we'll call it a day. Um, uh, <clears throat> I already kind of made some gripes uh, about how, well, technically this isn't linear. It's not linear because there is this uh, constant out front that uh, you can't have a constant out front like that uh, for a linear function. Right? But uh, other than that constant out front, what remains uh, is linear. So while the blue function that we actually care about is not linear, we're still going to use the word linear, and it's an abuse, and it's not linear. And mm, But uh, nevertheless, pretty reasonable to call it linear because most of what the function is truly is linear. Uh, and uh, thus the name. Okay, all right, drawing a line right there. See you all later. Have a good Wednesday. See you on Friday.